welcome to Arbitral Insights, a podcast series brought to you by our international arbitration practice lawyers here at Reed Smith. I'm Jose Estigarraga, Global Head of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Practice. I hope you enjoy the industry commentary, insights, and anecdotes we share with you in the course of this series, wherever in the world you are. If you have any questions about any of the topics discussed, please do contact our speakers. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the next episode of Arbitral Insights, in which we'll discuss the Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration with Chris Alberti, who's the SCCA Chief of ADR and General Counsel. I'm JP Duffy, international arbitration partner based in New York that acts as both counsel and arbitrator in international arbitration seated around the world under a variety of governing laws and arbitral rules. I previously practiced in Dubai, and I routinely represent clients in arbitrations involving Saudi and the GCC. I also have the good fortune to be listed on the SCCA roster and the good fortune to have known Chris for many, many years from his time in New York. With me today is Allison Eslick. Welcome, Allison. Thanks very much, JP. Yep, my name is Allison Eslick. I'm a senior associate in Reed Smith's Energy and Natural Resources Group, and I'm based in our Dubai office. I've practiced in the UAE since 2008, so that's quite a long time. And I specialize in international arbitration, both construction disputes and commercial disputes. Now, being based in the Middle East, I naturally have a keen interest in Saudi and over the years have been involved in several Saudi projects and disputes. I'm currently working on a construction arbitration under Saudi law, though this one is seated in London under the London Chamber of Arbitration and Mediation Rules. With us today is our guest, as I mentioned earlier, Chris Alberti. Chris is the Chief of ADR and General Counsel for the SCCA and is based in Riyadh, where he supervises the SCCA's Case Management Secretariat and Legal Department. Prior to joining the SCCA in 2019, Chris was the Assistant Vice President of the ICDR in New York, where he supervised staff and related management activities and oversaw hundreds of large complex multi-party arbitrations and mediations covering all types of disputes and industries each year. Before moving to the SCCA, he taught international arbitration and international sales law as an adjunct professor at NYU School of Law. And prior to joining the ICDR in 2005, Chris headed the Italian desk of a mid-sized law firm in Germany. Chris is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. And uh, as Chris remind me, we did that very interesting certification training together a few years back now. And he's also a member of several ADR organizations. And I'll just say again, we're thrilled to have him today to discuss this topic because he's really, truly an expert and really has fabulous insight to offer. So let's begin by talking about the SCCA and its background. The SCCA is a not-for-profit organization that was set up by royal decree in 2014 as part of the kingdom's 2030 vision. It became operational in 2016, and it provides both arbitration and mediation services with the stated objective of becoming the preferred ADR provider in the region by 2030. Chris, let me begin by asking you, does the KSA government play any role in running the SCCA? First and foremost, thank you so much for having me, JP and Allison. It's a pleasure to be with you. To your question, the short answer is no. Despite having been established by decree, the SCCA operates independently from uh, public and the private sector as a neutral, as you said before, not-for-profit ADR provider. Perhaps most notably, this is reflected by our board's constitution that provides that no member shall hold a government position. Now, speaking of the board itself, we're very blessed to have a good mix of Saudi international arbitration experts led by Dr. Walid Abadumai as the chair and uh, Toby Landau QC as vice chair with full operational autonomy. That's really valuable for listeners to know. So, you know, it's it's really it's always a question as to whether institutions have any have any government affiliation, and it's very helpful to know that that the affiliation is not anything more than tangential at best. Now, Chris, you spent many years at the ICDR, so perhaps you could give us some insight in what role the ICDR played in helping to set up the SCCA. Absolutely. Uh, so, the ICDR AAA has been absolutely instrumental in helping the SCCA to hit essentially uh, the ground running in 2016. As you may imagine, starting such an enterprise from scratch bears all kinds of risk. So the SEC had uh, the good fortune to have a big time-tested partner at its site to create, for example, the rules, uh, code of ethics, uh, code of conduct, and essentially also trading up its personnel on site in New York. 
I think what was most important uh, to us back then and still now is, is to build uh, instant trust, confidence that cases will be administered in accordance with international best practices and, of course, professional standards. And we would not have seen the, uh, cases coming in in such short uh, order if it was not for having demonstrated maturity and stability in this first year. That's really interesting and a really good, strong affiliation. Now, Chris, you mentioned the number of cases that the SCCA is administering. Before we get into actual statistics, does the SCCA administer both international and domestic cases or just international? We do also international cases. Uh, You had mentioned uh, previously the Vision 2030, and that vision, of course, attracts uh, lots of foreign investors from all parts of the world. Uh, now, our rules are based on the UNSA trial arbitration rules, and we also have just been listed by UNSA trial as one of globally 19 centers and only the third in our region. So it's a truly international center. That's correct. That's great. Now, given the, the, relative, um, the relative newness of the SCCA, but the incredible progress it's made since its functional introduction in 2016, What would you say the SCCA's greatest achievements have been since its inception? Uh, We've been quite busy. Uh, A lot of things have happened in a very short amount of time. Uh, When looking back, it's always incredible to see how much has been accomplished. Perhaps a couple of highlights in all brevity. Uh, In terms of products, uh, we have uh, launched our so-called a la carte services and relaunched our ODR protocol and online platform for smaller cases. We have just released in September of this year uh, the new Appendix 1, including uh, the fee schedule. This is all about costs of arbitration and so forth. We have uh, launched an entire project uh, that is best explained as being a nomination service for appeals courts when they deal with ad hoc cases. So we assist them essentially in uh, finding arbitrators. Uh, as for caseload, I'm very excited to say that last year we have seen our very first emergency arbitration, likely the first in KSA from what we know, institutionally certainly the case. Uh, we finished uh, two very successful mediation pilots referring cases essentially from the commercial courts to the SCCA, and that was done to raise awareness. We've uh, received our first mandate from the Permanent Court of Arbitration uh, to serve in the capacity as an appointing authority, so also another milestone achieved here. And uh, perhaps looking to the future to forecast caseloads, uh, we have been written into many model contracts. Uh, one perhaps to be mentioned, that would be the model government procurement contract uh, and there as the for default provider. Now, internally, a lot has, ha- has changed or happened as well, if you will. We have a rules advisory committee, which is currently very busy to uh, review our rules, the SSCA arbitration rules and uh, appendices. We also have a committee for administrative decisions, which, among other things, decides challenges to arbitrators. So consistency, continuity is preserved. Finally, perhaps on the educational side, uh, very happy, very excited about our third iteration of our Arabic Moot, which now goes international. And we have also expanded many programs, training programs, uh, with our partners at uh, Chartered Institute uh, within KSA in Arabic and English. And that's just to mention a few of those things that have occurred since launch. <laughs> well, that's quite an active schedule. So I think just if you're only mentioning a few, it's it's an impressive few, and I'm sure there's quite a bit more to discuss. But in the interest of time, then, let's let's turn over to Allison to talk more in depth about the, the caseload and what sorts of cases the SCCA has seen. Thanks, JP. Yeah, we really wanted today to get a, a bit more of a sense of the, the types of cases that are being heard at the centre and the types of parties who are utilising the centre. Now, we dug out some statistics that were publicly available. They're a little bit old but they indicate that from 2016 to 2018, 38% of the centre's cases were construction cases. Now, obviously, I am a construction litigator. So my first question to you is around the current caseload of construction cases at the centre. Can you give us an indication? Uh, Absolutely. And uh, just to give it some context, since we uh, launched, uh, we have registered 184 filings, of which uh, 68 this year alone. When compared to last year, 75, uh, we're on track to surpass the number. But now to your question, uh, construction has, to no surprise, I I should should say, uh, really taken off. Uh, We're currently hovering around 50% all over. 
Yes, and I suppose maybe um, with all the construction going on, these giga projects and, and certainly the development in Saudi, one, you know, it could be expected that quite a bit of your cases would be construction. But there are 50% of other cases that you've got there. And I know that the centre is much more than just a construction uh, arbitration centre. Can you tell us a bit more about the other types of cases uh, that you have? Uh, indeed. So again, construction is a low-hanging fruit and uh, any institution you ask, that's probably the biggest caseload. But yes, we do also have other cases. I was actually quite amazed when I joined uh, how diverse the caseload actually is. Second, In second place, if you will, uh, is banking and finance. And third place is real estate. But uh, we have seen uh, another 24 sectors, uh, uh, just to mention a few, energy, you have aviation, hospitality is up and coming. Uh, a lot of hotels are opening up right now again, and uh, what traveling is happening to Saudi. Entertainment is very important, has to catch up a lot, intellectual property, pharmaceuticals, insurance, uh, information technology, just to name a few. That certainly sounds like a really wide range of different industries. And then just lastly, to get a sense of the uptake of, of the center from international parties, can you give us a sense of what cases are international? with at least one international uh, party? And what percentage of cases are purely domestic? Uh, again, another point I was very surprised and pleased to see, uh, we have to date registered 29 international cases uh, with parties from, uh, believe it or not, 18 different uh, countries, stretching from all the way from JP's uh, place right now in the United States over to the UK, Germany, Italy, uh, all the way back to China and to New Zealand. So the remaining 155 findings uh, are, of course, domestic in nature. That's very pleasing to hear. And look, I want to move on to, to a different topic now, because in many ways, an arbitral institution is, is only as good as the quality of its arbitrators. So we want to ask you a little bit about the centre's arbitrator roster. Now, while we understand that the SCCA rules permit the parties to select arbitrators of their choice, the centre also maintains an arbitrator roster. Can you tell us a little bit about the roster members, where they come from, and what expertise they offer, and how many arbitrators you might have on the books? Indeed, uh, we have uh, taken it up on ourselves to actually create and maintain uh, an SSCA arbitrator and mediator roster, which, as you may imagine, is a lot of work. Uh, but we felt uh, part of our job is also to educate and uh, further uh, enhance the market, uh, case A market and beyond. So we really uh, thought to go 360 into this project and have that roster for us. Of course, this is something that has to be done uh, with a lot of care, uh, because as you said, your arbitrations are only as good as your arbitrator, so parties must be comfortable in what they're actually choosing. Uh, you mentioned briefly that parties can even choose their own arbitrators. That is also applicable to SCA. There are no restrictions to that. You don't have to use the roster. But you should, of course, uh, be sure that you find a neutral arbitrator and an arbitrator that has time to dedicate to your matter. Beyond that, you have to be very careful with Article 14 of the Saudi Arbitration Law. Article 14 provides, among other things, uh, that a sole arbitrator, or in case of three arbitrators, a chair must have a degree of uh, a law, in law or sharia. So that's very important to understand. But again, to the roster, uh, you can take advantage of the SSCA roster. Uh, we have currently, as I mentioned, uh, uh, perhaps before, 350 arbitrators and mediators. You can ask for a strike and rank list, which is very useful when parties have the wish to keep control over how to select, but don't know who to select. And perhaps finally, just to mention this, uh, the roster is composed of highly qualified and accomplished professionals from the legal as well as business communities who are, of course, with the subject matter expertise uh, in a particular field. Uh, they have to apply for the roster. It's a very rigorous process uh, that JP has gone through successfully. And it is indeed uh, something that is very dear to our hearts because, again, it comes and goes with the arbitrator. You have to have a high quality arbitrator who not only is uh, familiar with the subject matter, but also knows how to administer, how to manage a case when things are not going as uh, polished as they should. Thanks very much. And you did mention one, one restriction regarding the sole arbitrator and the Sharia uh, experience. Are there any other restrictions on who may serve as an arbitrator under the SCCA rules? Not really. Again, you, once you have uh, uh, been added to the roster, you are eligible to sit on cases. Uh, again, most of what we do is create lists for parties, uh, rarely Fortunately, rarely, I shall say, do we make administrative appointments because our goal is always to find cooperation among parties, to find a method, a mechanism. I mentioned the strike and rank list earlier to really get into this. Uh, beyond that, there is no real restriction. Uh, we will, of course, 
test your qualities <laughs> when you apply. And uh, if it's a fit, uh, then you're in. If it's not a fit, then we ask to apply in the, in the future once uh, you know, there's more qualification, more expertise, and so forth. It doesn't have to be a lawyer necessarily. It can be uh, someone from all walks of life. Uh, we have engineers, we have architects, we have uh, physicians. So it doesn't always have to be a lawyer. But traditionally, of course, that is the role that uh, most uh, have done in their life before. Great. And are there any areas the centre has identified which it would like to bolster its arbitrator experience? Yeah, again, by way of background, as I mentioned, we have 350 arbitrators. We have 26 nationalities, if my memory serves me well. We have 50 ladies, something we have to work on. We have covered so far around 20 industry sectors and 20 languages, so just to give you some numbers. But there's, of course, always room for more, uh, particularly in areas of construction, which is one of the biggest caseloads. Uh, energy, think of Islamic finance, telco is very important, but also the new and upcoming hospitality sector in KSA, just to name a few. We're also very interested to, of course, boost diversity by, among other categories, uh, the increase of the female quota. Uh, we have recently uh, signed the Equal Representation and Arbitration Pledge, or in short, the pledge, and also joined the uh, Racial Equality for Arbitration Lawyers, in short, RIAL. So just, uh, again, to further diversify, that is something that is also that we're looking strong into it. That's just so pleasing to hear, especially from a woman's perspective. Thanks for sharing that, uh, that news with us, Chris. I'm working with an all-female team, so if I may add that. <laughs> Good. Well, that's all very interesting. The statistics are quite fascinating. There's obviously been a lot of development since 2014 and 2016. Now, one of the other developments that I wanted to talk about that we'll wrap up with is enforcement. And this is obviously not unique to the SCCA, but I think you have a unique role that you play in this in this process. Award enforcement in the kingdom has been improving dramatically over the last few years, and particularly with the introduction of new legislation in 2013. And there have been numerous examples of foreign awards being enforced against Saudi parties since that time. And we all read about them and and hear about them because they're routinely touted now. It nevertheless remains a question that parties always have. And I know, Chris, you and I did a presentation for, for one of my clients a few months back, and it was one of the first topics that got asked about. So perhaps you could help the audience understand what the current state of play on the enforcement front is in the kingdom and what role the SCCA has played in training the local authorities on enforcement issues. So to answer your question, unfortunately, there isn't to this day no official repository for judgments that deal with arbitration issues. Uh, But we're very hopeful from what we hear that this may change very soon. Now, to overcome this lacuna of readily available case law, if you will, we're currently working on a project where we have uh, reached out to the respective stakeholders to obtain such arbitration-related judgments. So far, we have collected 500 judgments and uh, are currently um, analyzing this batch. Uh, the goal is really to publish an article and uh, tell that story that uh, what we're seeing every day, that we have positive trends and statistics. But I can say that from the 65 vacator proceedings, so those proceedings when an arbitration award, one party wants to set aside the arbitration award, uh, from those 65 vacator proceedings, uh, I've looked at only five were successful. So now that is significantly below the average we see from other seats, but perhaps more importantly, the reasons why five awards have been set aside in part or in full were reasonably uh, defendable. So again, these weren't just flukes. Uh, these were really uh, five awards that had to be set aside for all the right reasons from what I can tell from the judgments. So all in all, we're very pleased to see a pro arbitration friendly government backed by courts that under the new laws are doing their part to embrace arbitration. Not as competition, but as a complementary tool to litigation. To your other part of the question, uh, we are also doing our part by having developed materials on ADR to train judges. Uh, but perhaps uh, for your audience, most importantly, uh, we also keep hearing from various local and international law firms that uh, they have made very positive experiences uh, in going through this otherwise extra battle of enforcing uh, in Saudi courts. So all in all, it's, uh, it's a very positive outlook. That's really great to hear. And I think that's a really significant development that will give everyone a great deal of comfort choosing SCCA for their cross-border contracts. Well, you know, we could keep talking all day, but unfortunately we have limited time. So I'm going to reserve the right to invite you back in a few months to, to give further updates because obviously things are moving so quickly at the SCCA that I'm sure we'll have much more to discuss again if you come back, if you grace us again. And I, I hope you will. So with that, That concludes our discussion of the Saudi Center for Commercial Arbitration. 
I want to thank our guest, Chris Alberti, for his invaluable insights. And I want to thank you, the audience, for listening. You should feel free to reach out to Allison or I directly with any questions you might have. And we look forward to having you tune in for future episodes in the Arbitral Insights series. So thank you again, Chris, and we do hope to have you back. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure to be back. Arbitral Insights is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McArdle. For more information about Reed Smith's global international arbitration practice, email Joseas de Garaga at jia at reedsmith.com. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, reedsmith.com, and our social media accounts at Reed Smith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.